lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim from L'Oreal TV and L'Oreal Radio here live via Skype uh, with James Jacob Prash in England. Jacob, one of the believers had the question, there's a lot of stuff going, making the rounds on YouTube saying that the Star of David and the two triangles is of evil origin. Could Jacob please go into the truth on the symbol and Israel's flag? Nonsense upon nonsense. <coughs> lie upon lie. The two people who propagate this the most are either conspiracy theorists who are ignorant or anti-Semites. Let's address the issue. First of all, in Hebrew, in Jewish culture, in Judaism, the Star of David is not a star. It's not even a star. It is called Magen David. It is the shield of David. It represents divine protection, a configuration of the battle shield referred to in the book of Isaiah and adopted in its Roman variant in Ephesians 6. It's talking about a shield, a protection, divine protection. It's not a star. It's a shield. Later rabbinic interpretations, and I do not subscribe to rabbinic Judaism, explain it as a the configuration in the book of Numbers and Exodus of the tribes of Israel organized around the Holy Ark when they camped, each space and each triangle being one and it'd be a total of six. That's how they look at it. They don't see it as a star. Secondly, a symbol of witchcraft and sometimes Wicca is a five-pointed star called the pentagram. To this day, witches use it. Covens use it. But you'll also see it on uh, cartoons or you'll see it on commercial advertisements. Those people aren't using it deliberately as a demonic symbol. That's absolute nonsense. There was a brand of American soap that had 13 stars. A lot of Christians who were caught up in the pyramid scheme, Amway, began competing with this company, selling soap products. And they said, this is demonic, this is demonic. Well, Procter & Gamble, who were based in Cincinnati, uh, issued a statement saying, no, this was the original symbol of the United States, 13 stars, that's where we got it. <laughs> Because a symbol represents one thing at one time in one culture does not mean it means the same thing in another time in another culture. Let me begin with scripture. The cross was a pagan symbol of sun worship originally. In the Middle East, in the British Isles, you can see the Celtic cross, a cross with a circle around it. It had to do with worship of the sun. The symbol of the early Christians was the fish, Ichthos, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. We know that from the archaeologically uncovered inscriptions in the catacombs. It was a fish, the Ichthos. It was not a cross. The ancient symbol of Israel and the official symbol of the nation Israel today is the menorah, the seven candlestick lamp. 
that Jesus appears with in Revelation chapter 1, corresponding, we are told, to the Word of God. The real symbol of Israel is the menorah, not the Star of David. Well, it's something like this. The national anthem of the United States is the Star Spangled Banner, composed by Francis Scott Key. However, a Jewish American who was a, at least a nominal Christian, Irving Berlin, wrote a second one called God Bless America. <laughs> you can have a second anthem. Well, you can have a second national symbol. That is all. The American Eagle was not the original symbol of the United States. Thirteen stars in a circle were. That is today the symbol of the European Union. The same symbol varies from time to time, meaning to meaning. We know that the ichthys, the fish, was a symbol of Dagon worship. From the archaeological digs, not only in Gaza and near Gaza, and in uh, uh, places in Israel that are close to the Gaza Strip that have been excavated, such as Kiryat Gat, we know that the Philistines worshipped Dagon, the fish god. And we know from the ruins excavated in Heraklion, Anassos in Crete, that that was the god of, of the fish god, his symbol was a fish. So the same symbol that had been the figure of the demon god, and remember, the Dagons, the fish gods, fell down before the Holy Ark. Remember, in the book of Samuel, they fell down before the Holy Ark when the Ark was captured. The same symbol that was pagan was adopted by the early church. The same symbol that was pagan, the cross, was adopted by the early church. And so, a Magen David, seen as a shield, not as a star, and was adopted by Israel, Jewry, etc. When I was a little boy, it was the beginning of the space program. They called these things in the race to get to the moon, the space race with the Soviets, project names named after Greek mythology, the gods of Greece. Now Paul tells us other gods are demonoid demons. Mercury, the messenger of the gods, was the first. Then when they began putting two astronauts in one capsule, they called it Gemini. <coughs> then the moon god, Apollo. <laughs> These were simply project names used by NASA. It did not really involve the worship of ancient Greek gods that the first century Christians would have encountered and been up against. What a symbol means in one time and in one culture does not mean it has the same meaning in another time or another culture. God forbade the veneration of graven images. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Yet he commanded the carving and gold plating of cherubim to put on the holy ark. It was not the angels who were venerated, or, or, or the cherubim. But they were designs of what existed. So too, you had carvings in the temple ordained by what God showed David and Solomon and Moses about the temple. They were there. The same kind of symbolism exists in paganism. If it means one thing in one culture, it does not necessarily mean the same in another. Let me give you some more proof from scripture and archaeology. Moses was a prince of Egypt. The word of God tells us he was educated in the wisdom of Pharaoh before he was educated in the wisdom of God. I've been to Egypt many times. And I was once in a temple in Erdfu, Egypt, Erdfu, Egypt, south of Cairo, on the Nile. There is a temple there that existed in the time of Moses, very ancient. It had an outer court, 
It had a holy place and it had a holy of holies that only the high priest entered once a year. Only the high priest was the prince of Osiris. You can read the Psalms of Osiris, at least those who can read hieroglyphics can. Translated, they parody word for word almost the same as the Psalms of David, but give the glory to the wrong God, who's Yahweh. You are always going to have a pagan counterfeit of something real. Because a symbol or an element of architecture or anything has one meaning in one culture, it doesn't mean it has the same meaning in another. It's like anything else. It's like anything else. Sexual intercourse outside of marriage can be a defiling act of adultery or fornication. In marriage, it's the consummation of something God said. He made them male and female and said it was good. In one context, it's right. In a perverted context, it is wrong. The Star of David, it is not a star. I don't refer to it as a star of David. Nobody who knows Hebrew refers to it as a star of David. It is my Magen David. It is the shield of David. The same God, Jesus the Messiah, who protected David, protects me, and he protects you. This is just a reminder of it. Some pagans want to have a five-pointed one or whatever they want. You're always going to have that. Was it wrong to call the American space program going to the moon Apollo? Or Apollo 13 and Gemini and Mercury? Where do you want to draw the line? We can only draw the line where Scripture does. The cross itself was a pre-Christian pagan symbol. We can prove it. The fish was the original symbol of the church, not the cross. And the fish was a pre-Christian pagan symbol. Do not listen to these ignorant people speaking this idiocy. Now look, when believers got saved in the book of Acts, <coughs> they took their pagan books and emblems and burned them and destroyed them. If such things had been used in pagan worship, they represent the demonic. Some would argue, maybe with some credence, apparently in some cases with credence, that these objects are associated with demonic power or presence. I think that people say that a Freemasonry should burn their Masonic books and aprons. I think people say that a Roman Catholicism should smash their rosaries and burn their scapulas and icons and statues. I think that's good. This is not religious art because they venerated it. They prayed before these things. They bowed down to them and worshipped them. These things should be destroyed because they were pagan. But a cross or a fish or a star of David, just because it has some pagan equivalent or counterfeit, that does not invalidate them. We can only judge scripturally. Those who push this are either ignorant people buying into conspiracy theories or they're prejudiced or anti-Semites. Either way, they don't deserve to be paid any attention to. If you're caught up in this, abandon it. Renounce it. It's nonsense. Thank you for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth 
in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.